My name is Jonathan Moreno. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. I teach in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy and the Department of History and Sociology of Science. I'm a philosopher by training. I became interested in bioethics almost as soon as I started teaching philosophy uh, at George Washington University because I realized that the platform of a philosopher in the, that was, was then the 20th century uh, was a modest one and the excitement was in the emerging field of bioethics. So I was attracted for intellectual reasons and also for personal reasons like many people who started bioethics at least in those days. I had family experiences with ethical issues in the care of my parents and saw that there were extraordinary professional opportunities to work with physicians and later scientists on these issues. My wife said when we were first married and we went to a dinner party and people would go around the room and say what they did for a living, I said, well, I'm a, I'm a philosopher. It was dead silence. Once in a while somebody said, oh yeah, I, I, I took that course. <laughs> then a few years later when I started to say, well, I'm in bioethics, everybody had something to say. They had a personal experience, were worried about some bug getting out of a laboratory somewhere. Uh, there's always something. Uh, on the way here today, my taxi driver from the airport told me that he was Palestinian, asked me what I did. I said, I, I'm a bioethics professor. He said, oh, organ theft. People steal organs. There's always something. It's an inescapable conversation that human beings have. So there's always something cool, uh, even in the clinical setting, which often ends up badly. A few weeks ago I was visiting a major university hospital and uh, they had a patient who had a disorder that involves um, eating things that you're not supposed to eat and this was a patient who had eaten razor blades. He liked to eat sharp objects. That's not the kind of thing that's going to come by, by surprise in a philosophy seminar um, but then I can take it back to my class and talk about what you do uh, with that kind of patient. How do you make decisions for that person who's authorized to do that? Uh, how many times do you do an endoscopy when you know that somebody swallowed a sharp object and it doesn't necessarily help them to go by the book? So there's that end of it. But um, increasingly, in the last 15, 20 years, I've been attracted more to the way that science changes the culture, or the culture modifies science, so especially in neuroscience. What I find fabulous is the opportunity to talk to people who actually know something about those things and then try to figure out how to talk to other people about them. There is a vigorous debate in neuroethics right now about what's called moral bioenhancement. So, you know, could you, should we figure out a way to make people better? To me, that reduces to a political philosophy question. Who gets to do that? Who gets to decide what the goals of that kind of intervention would be? That takes us into a stratosphere <laughs> that is really hard to get your head around. Fundamentally, human beings will stumble along, uh, maybe we'll survive for a hundred years. There's lots of existential risk. Uh, I have a deep emotional attachment to my kids, and I will probably have a deep emotional attachment to my grandchildren. Schopenhauer has a terrific line, which I will not get exactly right, in which he said many people think that uh, human life is more about uh, happiness than unhappiness. Those who have that view may consider uh, watching one animal eat another and decide which one is more, more extreme in its emotion than the other. So William James is my favorite uh, philosopher and uh, he would not have wanted to be called a psychologist but he was that of course as well. Um, and um, one of the lessons I take from James that I I think he also took from Darwin, for example, is that there's no irregularities in, in the cosmos. There's always something, there's a smoothness underlying everything, even, even what appear to us to be radical change. I don't anticipate any radical change with my uh, grandkids' brains, no matter what we do with them. I do hope that um, we are better at handling depression and what we call, um, with the fuzzy diagnosis, schizophrenia uh, and the dementias. Uh, and what we now call spectrum disorders. Hope we're better at managing those. But a lot of that is not about drugs. A lot about that of that is institutional and environmental. I, I do uh, fear sometimes that we focus 
too much on the gadgets in the 21st century, uh, including the chemical gadgets, and uh, not enough on the social conditions in which people have to live. Well, this is a somewhat unusual gathering of the foundation people and the uh, venture capitalists and, and the ethicists in the same room in a small group. Um, that's not the way things have usually been done in the field of neuroethics, which is you know, maybe 20 years old. So I, would, I want to see what comes out of this, particularly with regard to the guidelines uh, that industry and public good organizations come up with in a field that is largely unregulated and ungoverned. Two things. Um, I was in China before the current epidemic in early December of 2019 for 10 days talking to people about governance of genetics and neuroscience. And they are, as we know, forging ahead. Although my impression is their neuroscience effort has been a little slow off the ground. I think they're they realize that. These issues are, to a very great extent, not going to be decided in a civilian context. So I think we are missing a whole lot if we don't take into account that there are a security angle here. In particular, in one area that I've been interested in for a long time, which is sort of human studies, human experiments, field testing of new technologies, that's where it's going to happen. That is really cutting edge stuff. And, and when you introduce the existential survival of a sovereign state into the equation, it changes the way people see things. And the last thing is also written about this, the first meeting of a group of thinkers about neuroscience and human values, I think was not actually in 2002, it was actually in 1998. What we might call a neoconservative think tank in Washington called the Ethics and Public Policy Center had a meeting. People were only at that time beginning to see neurotechnologies like fMRI, see what the implications could be. One of the big topics at that meeting, because of the nature of the sponsoring organization, was faith traditions and how neuroscience might change the way people um, understand and exercise their religious faith. What struck me at a, as I looked back at the Dana Foundation meeting and at meetings like this, and I don't profess to be a person of faith, but I must say it, struck, it strikes me that that's a topic that has been pretty much lost. There are other people out there who don't see things quite the same way and bring a different set of concerns to what people in science and engineering are generally working on.